Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Artspeak TV and Radio here on Westfield Community Programming Channel 15 and 89.5 FM WSKB. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer, and we're going to be spending an hour today with members of the political musical satire group, The Capital Steps, which have been around since 1981 and unfortunately have announced that they're going to discontinue programming. They st- the last performances took place last March uh, as the pandemic overshadowed uh, the country and their Washington performances and their national tours came to a screeching halt. And with the re- reality of live performing, which they specialize in, not being available through at least 2021 and maybe into 2022, they decided that it was time to pull down the final curtain uh, on a company that had poked fun at Republicans and Democrats alike since 1981 and equal opportunity offenders, taking some of the popular music and show tunes that you know and skewering some of the uh, politicians that we've all come to love or hate. So introducing everybody, I feel like we're on holiday squares. Just look at us all there. But upper left-hand corner is Elena Newport, uh, who is the co-founder of the Capitol Steps. Hi, Elena. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can sure. And on the upper right, I'm sandwiched by two fabulous people. On the upper right is Barry Bierne, who's been a longtime performer with the Capitol Steps. And on the bottom, Janet Gordon. Gordon Davidson, been with the Capitol Steps forever, Mike Thornton next to her, and Evan Casey. So we got five members of the Steps here today, which is really very cool. And um, first of all, how have you guys been doing and what have you been up to? And uh, let's see, Elena switched places here, but how have you guys been uh, during the last year? You're we'll bouncing, with, Elena. Yeah, we'll start with you, Barry. How <laughs> I are don't things? know how I did that. <laughs> that's, that's magic. How, how are things, Barry? Things oh, how, are, did you say Barry? Things are, go ahead, Elena. <laughs> no, no, you, you said Barry, right? Right, right, yeah. right. Things, things are, you know, two, 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 we're healthy. We're in our house for months and uh, we're just, you know, like the groundhog waiting to come out and, and yeah, know that it's gonna be spring finally and we can the get groundhog, out and The around. groundhog has come and went on a day <sighs> when, uh, Groundhog Day here in Western Massachusetts was a huge, mm. huge snowstorm. So I don't mm. know if that bodes well or not for our future. Janet, mm. where are you hiding out during the pandemic? Well, my husband and I have a place in Florida and the Sarasota area on the West Coast. And uh, we decided we had hesitated about coming this year, but we figured um, we could do the same thing here that we're doing at home, pretty much hang out inside and read books and (laughs) catch up on the latest streaming TV shows. And um, we can at least eat outside here. Yeah. What about you, Elena? Where have you been since uh, pandemic struck? Uh, Home in Alexandra, mostly. I I get very excited when the mail arrives or my plant grows a new frond on the on the fern, you know. (laughs) (laughs) And and Evan, what about you? Uh, I've been here at my home in uh, Wheaton, Maryland, uh, for almost the entire time. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of teaching here and there, which is why my name, as you see, is Theolab Five. That's not my new stage name. That is. (laughs) That's theater lab where I where I teach from time to time, um, and uh, I've been working on a couple of uh, independent projects from time to time. But mostly just been here with with my family. And while of course it's been unfortunate not to have uh, performance projects and things as many as I would like, having the family and that opportunity is a, is a one nice silver lining because we're always so busy with these kinds of lives that we have. So it's been that's been one good opportunity uh, throughout this past year. And Mike Thornton, I understand you've been living on a boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We decided to downsize to a to a boat, so uh, it's it's. I'm not on the boat right now. I'm actually on on the hard, as they say. Uh, uh, but but yeah, it's 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 challenging, and at the same time, it's uh, really remarkable because it's a great community of people, and everybody supports everyone, and it's. It's it's cool. I mean, you know, I, I've never lived in a house where you have to fill your water tank every week, you know, to have potable water, etc. So it's uh it's, it's it's really interesting. 
Well, I want to, the first question I want to ask is, um, I mean, I think we were all surprised when the decision was made, made to uh, shutter the Capitol steps, which had been such an important part of our political satire world uh, for the almost 40 years. Uh, I know it was a tough decision, Elena, um, and the prospect of live performance really is so questionable over the course of what's going to happen in 2021, let alone 2022. But um, this is a, an art form that just could not really translate necessarily to virtual, right? Yeah, really, you really need the energy of the live crowd coming back at you. Plus, when we have performers on stage, we're kind of you know, we're spitting at each other. <laughs> we're laughing at each other. <laughs> we're kind of the the, the 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 saliva is flying. You know, it's kind of like I think they tried to bring back opera in Russia and right away they had to shut it down because everybody's, you know, singing in each other's faces. And, and of course, the audience is central. You have to have people there laughing in person. Um, it doesn't translate well. Yeah. I thought I, I thought you might assume that I was going to ask you about who was the favorite um, political character that you have played over the course of those of you that have been there, like Elena from day one, who co-founded the troupe, but over the years you've been there. But so much has gone on since the pandemic shut things down. If the Capitol Steps were still performing right now, what political figure that has made a fool of themselves uh, over the course of the last year would you want to portray the most? We'll start with Evan. I mean, the, as we all know, this year has been a long year in the world of politics in a variety of ways, in part because all we could do was sit and watch the news. So it's hard to name one. But I guess most recently, most recently, um, Given that we have plenty of experienced members within the group, but I still remain on the somewhat younger side of the group, probably uh, Josh Hawley would probably be a good would be a good pick, I think, uh, for me to portray. Yeah. Uh, do you have a song in mind for him or uh, would you count on Elena to make that determination? <laughs> Um, you know, I think Elena and Mark could probably uh, make a good determination, but probably something that is in keeping with uh, his attempts to be i mean i i his his attempts to be um that that to be more than he is while sticking to his you know missouri roots something that something that appeals to the to the countryside and of of, of who he is i think would probably be good yeah what about you barry i I have to admit that I I was so excited when I heard Sarah Huckabee Smith was going uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was going to be running for uh, governor of Arkansas because she was one of my favorite characters to play. Just walking on stage, you get the biggest laugh ever because she's such a happy-go-lucky person, you know, and easygoing and uh, and and so nice to everybody. Well, yeah, so she would I, be my pick. I think. except to the media. Uh, you know, would she get up there and point her fingers at like me? It made me cringe a little bit, but uh, she definitely my would be is somebody worth and portraying. So am I. <laughs> what about you, Janet? Probably um, two characters that I have been playing for the last several years would be AOC and Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, they've always been they've always been uh, fun. And Mike, uh, you remember the guy with the horns? At the Capitol. Oh yeah, yes. the shaman, shaman guy. Yeah, but my mom told yeah. me that I, I have to eat organic food, otherwise I can't perform. So, <laughs> and I, I just I just read in the paper I or I think this morning or heard on line that he got transferred from the Washington prison to mm -hmm. one in Northern Virginia because mm -hmm. the Northern Virginia one serves organic food. <laughs> And that's one of his demands. I, I think it, there's definitely a character there. Elena, which current uh, Politico making fools of themselves would you like to write a song about? Well, let me just say, first of all, I think Evan would be an excellent Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I take, that, I take that compliment. Um, no. Um, yes, obviously she's very funny. I loved playing Nancy Pelosi because... You just freeze your face and blink real fast, and everybody thinks it's a brilliant impression. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Um, 
but to be honest, there were some things over the past year I was glad I didn't have to write songs about. You know, pandemics and Proud Boys are not necessarily funny. So um, it's good that some of the crazier characters are coming back. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, certainly the pandemic brought out the crazy in quite a few. I mean, I'm surprised that uh, that had the Capitol Steps still been performing, that there wouldn't have been a Kaylee McEnany sketch of some sort, mm -hmm. because she is so, Im uh, on the late night shows and everything else, she's so easy to imitate, and um, she just provides enough material you could do an hour on her in, in some way. Um what are, I know it's it's difficult for you guys because you all have to switch course at this point, not only because the capital steps are uh, bringing down the curtain, but because it's difficult doing performance art of any kind during a pandemic. Are any of you working on any projects that um, you hope to bring to fruition when things lighten up? Start with Mike, because I know you're working on a play. Yes, I am. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's it's 75 minutes of nine characters, and I play all of them. Um, it's, this it's this wonderful play called The Absolute Brightness of Leonard Pelkey uh, by James Lacine. And uh, he's an Academy Award winning uh, a writer, fantastic actor, and playwright. And uh, he, uh, he, he did the Trevor, he created the Trevor Project. Mark, you might be. Uh, familiar with and wrote also a book about called Trevor and uh, it's it's really um, I'm, I'm putting as I said to Elena earlier I said I'm, I placed the cart right in front of the horse because uh, because I'm learning the play and I have no idea where it will be uh, produced yet but I figured if I have it learned then when the world comes back in session I'll be ready to go so I'm making a trailer and uh, I'm going to uh, Sell it around, pedal it around the country. It's a it's a fantastic play. It actually had a performance run here in Hartford a couple of years ago, right um, with James, right? Uh, with James uh, Lacine, who is the uh, writer. Um, mm -hmm. Barry, you work in a variety of projects all the time. What's on on your uh, agenda at the moment? Barry had to switch to another room, um, oh. Mark, for internet reasons. So oh. I'll I'll play Barry for the moment. Okay. I'm, I'm playing Barry, Barry Baron in an upcoming series, straight to Hulu. No, um, I am. Uh, I've been I've been teaching a bit uh, off and on, uh, particularly with a with a group called the Theater Lab, which does great adult performance courses in DC, and I've worked with them for several years. <laughs> um, and then I'm working on a project, a sort of a, a hybrid Zoom film play kind of thing with a playwright friend of mine that. Uh, I've been working on for several months, which we're sort of self-producing um, and then similar to what Mike said, going to sort of shop around to uh, various uh, people that we might have affiliations and relationships with producers around um, and uh, see how and in what way it might be um, good for uh, their audiences. And um, yeah, it's, it's good to have something to, ha to use, uh, to have a creative outlet of some sort. So that's been my main. Yeah. Focus. And Janet, what about you? Janet. You're muted, Janet. <laughs> You're muted. We yeah, we yeah, could Jan do a whole so this if Capital Steps were still in business, we would be doing a whole series of like "You're Muted" songs, like that. Absolutely. That would be the whole exactly, thing. Be, exactly. <laughs> all over the Zoom thing, all over. I had to mute because my dog was barking. So uh, hopefully she's that's that's up fair. By now. That's fair enough. I mean, I've been doing. It's so weird for me to be doing Zoom radio and TV and see. Some doing a serious interview. I was with one of the theater directors a couple of weeks ago, who has her kids home from school, and all of a sudden there's a five year old um, sharing the screen, wanting her her to open the can of soda or whatever. And uh, somebody else I was interviewing, their books started to shift. Uh, a cat knocked over some books out of a bookcase. So this whole thing of Zoom world and, and stuff is totally weird. Um, <laughs> Janet, now that you're unmuted. Now that I'm unmuted. Um, I've kind of been in that not sure what to do zone. Um, so I've, I've done a, a one woman show before that I you know, took around sort of the local area and um, comedy songs mostly. So um, I could do something like that. 
we'll see what happens. I'm a SAG member. I've been in uh, honorable withdrawal for <laughs> many, many years. So, um, you know, there's opportunities there that once I sort of get out of this uh, COVID zone, we'll see. Yeah. And, what, and Barry? Well, uh, my husband and I have both been auditioning for voiceover work. Um, he was able to rig up a little studio in our uh, in one of our rooms. So uh, so we're doing that. I also uh, I'm going to embark on a couple of opera projects. And somebody actually contacted me and said they want to use uh, one of my librettos for a uh, an animation um, project. So that so that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, that up right now. That's that's <laughs> that's what uh, that's what's on my plate. And Elena, uh, I know that you're you're still hawking uh, Capital Step CDs and uh, things like that. So, mm -hmm. do you are you going to retire at this point, or uh, <laughs> when everything is is closed down, or are you going to find something else? Well, it's funny because uh, the minute we announced that we were winding down, um, people started ordering. They had to have all the CDs, the whole catalog. So people have been ordering, you know, George Bush Sr., Stand By Your Dan, um, Obama Mia, all the old, like all the way back to, what, 1984 was our first album. They've been ordering the whole thing, like $200 worth of albums in one, uh, in one box. And um, we've been, so we've been still keeping the office open to keep those orders going. And then after that, I don't know, maybe I'll travel the world when it's allowed. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, um, so people can still get the CDs if they go to the website, correct? That's right. We still have them on our uh, capsteps.com website. And uh, some of them are actually selling out, some of the older titles. So uh, get them while you can. Yeah. Um, and what about, uh, are you going to maintain the YouTube channel um, that has a lot of your songs on it uh, after things close down? Yeah, I guess things can, can things stay on YouTube forever. I guess they can. I don't know. Unfortunately, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Evan's been trying to get that uh <laughs> That video taken down. Huh? Yeah, because there's quite a, <laughs> quite a few of them up there. So I was going to say to people, uh, go to the uh, Capital Steps YouTube page if you want a little, uh, kind of like their greatest hits uh, kind of thing. So be, we were supposed to take a, an underwriting announcement break now, but I'm going to push it back a little bit um, and ask you, if you think back about, first of all, when did you – each of you get involved in the Capital Steps at the beginning. And I know, Elena, you got started in 1981 and actually were part of the very first performance. But the rest of you joined later. So just to give the audience mm -hmm. a perspective, um, you guys have been with the Capital Steps for decades. So, Mike, when did you mm -hmm. first join the Capital Steps? Uh, I believe it was 19, early 1998. Eight, I I think that's right. I'm not absolutely sure, but I think that's when it was. My daughter was uh, just a few months old, and she's 23 now, uh, Fosse, and I was doing Sheer Madness, I think, at the time at Kennedy Center, and uh, and I think that's when it that's when I joined. Yeah, and um, Barry, when did you come on board? Uh, I started with the Clintons, uh, January 1993. Wow, Evan. Yep. I started uh, with Obama's first uh, run for president, so spring of 2008. Okay, and Janet? And I think, I know I came in after Barry. I think I was like June or July of 1993 during the Clinton, beginning of Clinton. Yeah. Wow. It um, I, I since, since we're all friends on Facebook, I get to see your postings every day. And the other day, Barry posted a picture of Barry and Janet somewhere in Fairbanks, Alaska, <laughs> because it always seemed like at the end of January or um, beginning of February, the Capitol Steps played Anchorage in Fairbanks almost every year. Go, over the years, what has been the number one favorite city you've gotten to perform in um, or that something unique happened in that will always stay in your memory? Janet. Well, I think it may have been that two week Alaska tour we did. And I think it was, yeah, and Barry yep. is nodding. I think that that was, was it 2012, Barry? 
Oh, it was, no, it was, I think it was after that. Uh, it was. Oh, uh, was, right. Because it was, it was definitely. Oh, no, no, you're right. It might have been, was it 2012 or 2008? I know that we were doing, we were doing Sarah Palin. Yeah. So it um, must have been around that period of time. Right. Two weeks, and I was dreading it because I really don't like cold weather. Um, and we went the end of January, and I was mm -hmm. even checking, you know, I was Googling, you know, how, what time is it going to get dark? Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I, I, <laughs> I really hate the short days, but it turned out to be like the most fun ever. Well, and I think I can I add to that is that that sure. because uh, because the weather was was so uh, unpredictable, they um, they scheduled shows every other day in case we missed a, our connection to to get to the next city. But fortunately, we were able to uh, make all of all of our flights, so we had an extra day in each city, and right. so we, that gave us time to uh, explore, meet people. Uh, just really enjoy Alaska. Alaska, because of the steps, Alaska is now my my favorite state. It's I just fabulous. love it. Yeah, now yeah you, but, but you've only gotten to tour with the Capitol Steps here in the winter. Elena never booked you in the in, in the cruise ship <laughs> season of summer, right? <laughs> they wouldn't. They wouldn't have us in the summer. Everybody, they have that few months they can get out. They don't. They, they want entertainment in the winter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, Mike, you uh, where? Do you have one particular place that uh, you recall that was one of your favorites on tour? I always loved uh, uh, Sanders Theater at at Harvard uh, in, in in Cambridge because it, the, the the audiences there are just just so raucous and off the wall. And literally, when I first came out as as uh, when forty five first got elected and I came out as him, I was literally just about booed off the stage and I had to I had to stop and say hey hey you know look somebody's got to do it or something like that just to get them back <laughs> and uh which you know which I never do it's not a good thing to do but they, they wouldn't let me go on and then they laughed and they they forgave me and I, I kept going but it's a it's it's such an amazing group of people and it's a it's a, it's a big crowd it's a historic theater it's a great town to hang out in elaine and i did that show a whole bunch of times together and mark i know you helped with that uh, for many years yeah uh no, anyway, I, did, I did it every i think i did it every year yeah that's right janet of course yeah you did too mm -hmm. yeah i loved it and uh, yeah. elena you must have one favorite outside of um reagan theater in washington that uh one tour mm -hmm. performance set well actually I, I wanted to get back to your question about the auditions because i I always loved auditions because when people would come in, especially Washington area performers like Evan, and they they sing a song and they'd sing it beautifully and knock it out of the park and it would be just great and we'd be so impressed. And then we'd say, okay, now can you sing that song like Kim Jong Il would sing it, you know, or something like that? And then we they'd be, they'd be like, what? I remember that. I remember that. And, and then they'd realize that once they joined the group, they actually had to do things like that. So uh, I think I remember doing that to Evan. <laughs> but yeah. um, as for favorite cities, oh man, we loved going out to Caltech every spring because it's beautiful and um, the audiences were so smart and uh, the Disney folks would come. As a matter of fact, Richard Sherman, who wrote Mary Poppins, would come every year. And he's still, you know, he's in his 90s now. And he was so nice. And we always knew we would never get sued using a Disney song because <laughs> we had That's friends right. at Disney. Yeah, one of our favorites was uh, the that Elena wrote was the um, during the whole Lorena Bobbitt. If anybody <laughs> can go back that far with the bippity bobbity boo, nip like a bobbit. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just thinking about that now. Yeah, that that goes way back on the timeline. <laughs> Evan, we didn't get a, give you a chance to. What was uh, a favorite city of yours on the road? Uh, well, in all honesty, I'm. I, I promise you, I'm not trying to just ingratiate myself to the host or your listeners. But traveling to the Berkshires uh, every summer was really 
one of my favorite things to do. I, I would I would book it on my calendar every year that I was available to do it. And just being up in that part of the country, uh, uh, being at Cranwell and traveling around um, the the nature that was up there, the art that was up there, the antiquing that was up there, made me feel like a like a right old man. No, but it made me feel it made me feel um, uh, it was it was a wonderful place for me to uh, to be. And also the other the other major city that I loved was. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina. I loved traveling there, but I would be remiss if I didn't also say that like, you know, then there are the trips where I remember one, I think it was 2012 election season. I just, we flew to Ohio and traveled by car to like, you know, six, seven cities. And that's, you know, not always necessarily something you bookmark as a highlight vacation spot for yourself, but I would never have had the opportunity to do it otherwise. And you see all kinds of different small towns and big towns that and different communities of people that you would never otherwise have necessarily engaged with were it not for the opportunity to do this work. And that's something that I really treasure about the group. Yeah. I've been very lucky, I've got to say, that I've done work with the Capital Steps. It started with uh, when I was working for the public radio station uh, here, and Mike Thornton brought in the Capital Steps for several years on our special events series. And I got to know a lot of people. And then the opportunity to do some of the press for some of the city tours and then get to do the two Cranwell things and some of the other national press. I think I will miss Cranwell the most. I thought that, that the setting was just so incredible there. Even the last season that we were all were there and the place was totally ripped up and under construction and all that. But the drive up uh, from the Mass Pike up into the Berkshires, you couldn't have asked for a more beautiful place to do uh, theater. It was just yep. walking around. And, and you guys will be mm -hmm. interested to know that Cranwell was purchased and is now the Miraval Resort um, they've completely renovated it. It's much different and much more high scale and upscale than any of us could have ever imagined. So, hey, can I uh, can I change my answer? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sure. What's your change it? No, I, I was thinking city, but you know what? I, I have so mm -hmm. many friends in the Berkshires, and and mm -hmm. and I'd really truly if when we retire, if we ever retire, that's where I'll be because I just love. I love the Berkshires and I've got friends that I've had there from years ago when I was in another life when I was putting a theater together up there and I've had friends for 30 years there. So I, I do as well love the Berkshires. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to me, the Berkshires of all the places I've worked over the years, the Berkshires are great. Although my best theater memories of all times are actually in Washington, D.C., because as a teenager, started working at Wolf Trap, and I spent mm -hmm. several summers while I was in college working there, and then was their youngest ever box office manager, and that sort of started my professional uh, career in theater. So Washington, D.C., to me, is a real special place, but it's not as pretty as the Berkshires, except in cherry blossom time. We're going to take a quick break to acknowledge our underwriters who make programming like this possible here on uh, Westfield Community Programming Channel 15 and 89.5 FM WSKB. And we're going to segue with a musical break. I wanted to um, play one of the songs that made the Capitol Steps uh when they performed it made people laugh all over the place but also to honor Dolores King um, Williams who sang this song uh, about Omarosa who disappeared from uh, sight shortly after the song came out. So we're going to segue into a break with that and we'll be back more with the Capitol Steps uh, left to right. Janet Gordon Davidson on the upper left, Mike Thornton upper right, Evan Casey lower left, Elena Newport underneath me center square and Barry Byrne on lower right. We'll be right back. I was top advisor to the president, you see. Often he would call me his top dog. Sometimes he would buzz me on the intercom and say, Can you come here, man of God? Oh, Marosa, oh, Marosa. 
he would call me. What exactly is your job here? He would ask. And I'd say, I see it plainly, and it's mainly. I am your African American on staff. Then one day I heard him say that he had canned me. So I wrote a book while walking out the door. No, I cannot prove Donald ever used the N word. But he has used the F word, fired, that's for sure. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Barnes and Noble College Bookstore in the Ely Campus Center. Offering Westfield State t-shirts, sweatshirts, and gift merchandise. All of your academic needs and offering textbook materials in new, used, ebook, and rental formats. Available at the bookstore on campus or online at westfieldstate.bncollege.com. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Bay State Dental. Comprehensive dentistry at 14 convenient locations in Springfield, Chicopee, Longmeadow, West Springfield, Belchertown, East Longmeadow, Ludlow, Northampton, Greenfield, and Wilbraham, as well as 29 Broad Street in Westfield. Bay State Dental makes it a priority to help you achieve and maintain the healthy smile you deserve. On the web at baystatedental.com. Hi, it's Bob Plass, and I have Wow! It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 6 to 8. Wow! It's Tuesday. Community Radio. 89.5 WSK. I did it! <laughs> Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Artspeed, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. If you missed a part of today's program or you want to listen to it again or you want to go back to some of the archives of Artspeed programs that we actually did from Cranwell with members of the Capitol Steps, they're all archived at WSKB Community Radio's YouTube page. And one of the things that I was most thrilled about was for two consecutive seasons, I was able to take our entire Arts Beat crew up to Cranwell and spend the afternoon with various members of the Capitol Steps on the air. Mike was on a program. Janet was on one. Barry was on two. Evan was on one. And Elena, I don't think you were on tour at that point, but there were several other members of the Capitol Steps. And I've got to relate on a personal level on in 2019 when we came up there to film uh, a two one-hour specials with the Capitol Steps. I had been in rehab after an accident, and I was wheelchair-bound, and I was determined to get out of rehab to anchor that particular two-hour thing. And one of the guys that uh, I worked with uh, had a van that the wheelchair could go in and the whole shebang, and I was able to do the two hours, not realizing that the flooring in the hall where we were performing and taping was was slightly raked, so I had to hold on to an eight-foot table underneath the microphones oh to keep from rolling off the set and out the front door. I didn't know that. But that was my return to radio after like 12 weeks of being flat on my back. Mm -hmm. So it's when I think of the Capitol Steps, doing that program was my return to walking and things like that. So I will be eternally grateful to all of you guys for giving me that opportunity to come out of rehab to do that show. So we just wanted to make you laugh, Mark. We yeah, and you did. And you you did and continue to throughout um, you know, every time I go back and I see it because it airs every so often here in reruns and it's there on YouTube and gets a lot of hits. But every time I see it I just think back and laugh about my funny experience with the Capitol Steps. And I never thought that an eight foot table had a little 
a rim underneath it that I could hold on to to keep rolling off a set. So <laughs> thank you guys for that. Janet uh, Gordon-Davidson on the upper left-hand screen, Mike Thornton on the upper right, Evan Casey lower left, Elena Newport uh, center uh, below, and Barry Barron, uh, members of the Capitol Steps, the political satire troupe that's been just touring the country for 39 years has just ended a great long performance run. Um, you guys have gotten to play tons of different characters. Is there a particular political person that's going to remain in your psyche for having portrayed them over the years? Janet? Hmm. There are so many. Probably, I don't know, one, when I had friends and family come, they just always loved to see me play Kim Jong Il or Kim Jong Un, whichever, whichever, one, whichever one was, you know, alive at the time. Yeah, but you got and to play both of them, right? I did. Yeah, I did. You know, with the with the troll wig and the and the Nehru kind of and the the sunglasses because I think he secretly wanted to be Elvis. And the song was usually "How do you solve a problem like Korea." Yeah, and that's on YouTube, so um, people can go catch that. What about you, Mike? Oh, I think uh, the the uh, the glory days with Bill Clinton. I think uh, that that really it never got better than that. So that was always fun. Elena, you wrote most of the characters you played uh, or wrote their material. Which one did you pl write and perform? That's like amongst your favorites. Well, you know, the, the most fun ones to write were the characters who mangled their language all the time. Like I loved writing uh, for George W. Bush because you could just make up, uh, he would come out and say, oh, I'm, uh, I'm able to laugh at myself because I have a self-defecating sense of humor or something like that. Um, but way going way back, my favorite maybe of all time was Ross Perot oh. because he would say things like, uh, we just wrote folksy sayings for him, like, you know, the deficit's like having a rattlesnake down your pants. You know, you got to take out your gun and shoot it, but you don't want to hit nothing important. You know, like, he, he would just like, that's how he would talk. So it was really fun to sit around and think of, how would Ross Perot say this? Um, and then, of course, we got to do it again. There was other characters who mangled their language, George Bush, Donald Trump, you know, a lot of people mangled their language. And... Um, so we, to be honest, we reused some of them. <laughs> yeah, you've re, you've reused a couple of songs over the years with different uh, people. Yeah, we had we, there were some favorites. Like one of our favorite openers was to take supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and put whatever was in the news at the time to that song. Um, I remember there was one about the California runoff. There was one about the, if superdelegates decide it would be quite atrocious. That was when the superdelegates were going to the convention. Um, and like I say, knowing Richard Sherman, and he came to our show every year, it was especially fun to write songs to that because, uh, you know, the Mary Pop everybody knows Mary Poppins. Exactly. Um, Barry, uh, one of your favorites? Mm -hmm. Uh I was frozen for a moment. So is it one of my favorite characters? Is yeah. that what you're, what are you, okay. Uh, Sarah Palin, speaking of somebody who mangles language. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. Um, I loved, I loved uh, doing her. And the first time I had to do her in, in Alaska, I remember I was terrified because I didn't know how she would go over, but, um, but, uh, they they liked it. <laughs> so, but that's another thing about working in the steps is that sometimes when you go on stage, you have no idea whether the audience is going to embrace your character or like Mike was saying, uh, they're coming out as a character that, that everybody's going to boo. I mean, it's, it's always, uh, it's always, you just never know. It's always seat of the pants. Yeah. And Evan, but you, have I, to, you have to commit no yeah. matter what. <laughs> Evan, I mean, I uh, I thought one of the most interesting characters that you did was Putin and then switched to the royal family in the same show within seconds. Mm -hmm. um, what Did you have a favorite? Well, yeah, I was I was a fan of any character where sort of subtlety and nuance flies out the window. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, like B Bernie, of course, uh, Putin, yes. Sure. Yes. The queen of England, all of these people where like, you can be 
larger than life and still within the scope of what we would accept as like comedic reality because they are outsized individuals um, is those were always the most fun to play because you could always it's sure it's fun to play within the margins but when you expand the sandbox that's when it's really fun and I just want to add one thing to to Barry's point about not sort of knowing that or what what sort of audiences what you might receive I remember one time I think it was the first uh, fall I was with the steps in the fall of 08 and we went to do a show in Salt Lake City I think in, in Utah and you know, we were like, oh, here we go. We're, we're expecting something very, very specific. Um, you have people have certain assumptions about the kind of of uh, not even an audience, but population that might be in Salt Lake City um, and what their uh, particular conservatism might be, perhaps or or whatever. And uh, they were the one of the most boisterous, raucous uh, you know, uh, crowds I've ever experienced in that fall or ever. So to what Barry said, yes, a lot of times you had to. We, we all performers make assumptions about what they're going to experience. Um, and then frequently with the capital steps, we were proven wrong. You know, you have to just sort of like take whatever comes with you and accept that and roll with the punches. And you, you might think one thing's coming, but something else comes entirely. And that was part of the fun of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned on another time when I had a chance to interview you guys, somebody mentioned uh, an audience member going bonkers. I think it was a French lady. Uh, and I can't recall what the situation was. Uh, but were there any uh, particular performances that you did where the audience just reacted in a way you never thought would happen or just turned into total buffoonery? I remember once we were doing a private show in um, at a country club, I think in Bethesda or Potomac. And it was when uh, George W. was president. And I think Mike, you might have even been playing him that night. I'm not sure. The but, CD incident, right? Yeah, yeah. This um, he, came, you know, he, you were doing a number, and this guy just stood up and said, "That's not necessary," and he just stormed out. <laughs> he stormed out of the room, and we had our CD set up on the table in the lobby, and he just took his arm, his hand, and just pushed them all <laughs> off into the floor, <laughs> and. Yeah, so you just never know. When I was first playing, uh, when I first joined the group, it was second. It was uh, Clinton's second uh, term, I think. And my mom, who loved him, just loved him from Connecticut, she came to see us at Chelsea's in Georgetown. And uh, I remember, oh, hey, Ma, so did you have fun? And she was she was very upset that making fun of my president. That's how you make your living. <laughs> <laughs> she 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 really got over it very quickly when she realized that we're equal opportunity offenders. But I think at the her first uh, her first instinct was to just you know that's that's my guy you know my my son's making fun of him so you never know. We had to do a show the night of that election, that Clinton's re-election, and it was a conservative business crowd, and the guy who played Clinton had to go out on stage and face this crowd. And I remember he ad-libbed the line, it was great. He went out and he said, uh, I'm sorry I won. I didn't really think I would win. I just thought running was a great way to meet babes. <laughs> 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 and that kind of broke the ice. Do you remember who that was, he? That was Mike Tilford. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys Sounds have gotten like to, you guys have gotten to perform in front of a lot of presidents and a, a lot of the people that you made fun of. Um, mm -hmm. What was their reaction when you uh, impersonated them on the stage? Well, back um, last fall, before COVID started, we did a, a democratic function in Maryland, in the Baltimore area, and we were right in front of, Nancy Pelosi was at the table right in front of us. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> she was sort of on her cell phone the whole time looking down. <laughs> but when we did one number where I was playing her, she did look up and sort of give me like a little, you know, there's a little twinkle in her eye, like, ha ha ha. <laughs> but the first, <laughs> it was a pretty busy time for her, I guess, because the first impeachment was just starting. So yeah. she was. How did the presidents react when you performed for them? <clears throat> well, the, the George Bush Sr. Was, was the best for it. He uh, invited us to perform many times. And in fact, one time the staff said to us, now be careful, don't do anything about 
the president or the vice president, or I think, you know, it was Quayle at the time. Um, so we tried our best. And at the end of the show, George Bush Sr. came up and said, now I think the show's been censored. I want to see what you have about me. So he was a great sport. He invited Dana Carvey to the White House and he loved it. Um, Clinton was was very a very good audience. He cracked up. We did Al Gore's 49th birthday party. Um, we never did get to perform for Obama, and I don't know. Uh, we certainly didn't perform for the last president who shall remain nameless. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think the last president who shall remain nameless uh, participated in anything cultural during his four years in Washington. <laughs> did you ever see him laugh? I never, I, saw never him, saw him laugh. I never saw him laugh. And um, only the rice, only derisively. Yeah. Right. I never saw him mm-hmm. laugh. Um, but I mean he immediately when he was elected, he refused to attend the Kennedy Center honors because he said he didn't want to, you know, hassle the crowd or anything like that. But from people that I know, they said they never saw them over the four years of time at a at a theatrical event or anything like that. And I don't think that prior to that, he was seen on Broadway or in any shows. So it's probably unlikely. But did anybody in the Trump administration catch any of your shows? Well, Not that I know of. Barry, remember Sean? Oh, Barry. that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, it was actually a number I wrote, and and it mentioned Sean Spicer, and um, he happened to be in the crowd, and it was a, and they wanted him to uh, before the show. They said they wanted him to be in one of the numbers, so he was in that number, <laughs> and yeah. it was, it, uh, and he was a good sport about it, <laughs> but. Um, uh, it was I, it was the only time I think I was uh, I was able to get one of the people from from the Trump administration up on stage. Yeah, you guys have performed in, in your over the years. You've utilized a lot of music from Broadway and mm-hmm. top forty songs and things like that. Um, and sometimes you've used the songs more than once, uh, readapted. Uh, what uh, uh, this question I guess goes to Elena. What made you choose the songs that you chose because you went for real recognizable tunes right you had it it was best if you had a good pun on a song that everybody knows like obama mia okay so everybody knows mama mia and it's a good pun and like janet said how do you solve a problem like korea like you're looking for a song that's in the common culture and also that has a good pun with whoever you're writing about and then you've got to laugh for starters and then you can take it from there now, you guys created this whole uh, sequence called Lurdy Dies, which was by twisting the first letter of certain words, just completely changed the context of everything that was said. Who invented that? Oh, well, that's called Spoonerisms. And so it's a, sort of an old thing, an old vaudeville thing. I think somebody did a Cinderella, slopped her dripper. Um, you know, it's an old bit. But we took it to, you know, apply to modern political scandals. I think the first one we did was Harry Gart and Ronna Dice. Um, And, you know, Mm -hmm. we gave you good chances. You can cover something very dirty, a scandal that you couldn't say much about, (laughs) and and do innuendo without actually saying any dirty words. Like you'd say, the American lay of wife instead of the American way of life. And it's, you know, it's within that PG rated, but it's but it's very funny to hear it that way. But now Mike did it. Maybe he remembers a few of those uh, a few of those bits. Yeah, I, oh, I've yeah. seen Mike perform it before, but did did everybody in the Capitol steps do that, or was that only mm-hmm. certain people? Certain people. No, did. it was uh, Mike. Take it from here. <laughs> oh well, well, generally we were sort of on a track. Right, right, Evan. I mean, the guys are sort of on a track to do like the singing part, the, this part, the, that part, the president versus the the foil to the president, and what you know, all that. And there, there are a few of us that did the the, the lurdy dies, as we called it, um, but which are spoonerisms, I guess, named after Reverend Spooner from Oxford or something back in the turn of the last century. Um, and uh, and I've forgotten most of it. My brain is pretty much crowded with the show I'm trying to learn. You know, I only have so many spells <laughs> left. You know, but but this but literally you could go on for ten or twelve minutes, I think, and you sort of have to train the audience, you know, uh, to 
slowly understand that you're, you're for the next 10 minutes, they're going to see something backwards. So you start off slowly and then you try to bring it up to speed. You watch their faces, you, you see if they're really with you or not, you know, and you, and you, you just go for it. And it's, it's always, it's been a real signature. Elena wrote uh, all kinds of wonderful flirty dies. Uh, Bill Strauss did a whole bunch of course back in the day. And, uh, and it's just, it was always towards the end of the show. And it was kind of like um, one of our, one of our signature pieces, even though it changed, pieces of it would remain the same, pieces of it would carry over, and then you'd update it as we went. And it was always great because, as Elena said, we um, they were so good about keeping everything PG, so, you know, the whole family could come to our show. And we've, that was yeah. one of the we've, things I thought was great. We've only got a couple of minutes left, and one question I wanted to ask was, um, when people take a look back at the theatrical history of political satire, uh, people like the Capitol Steps or Randy Rainbow, who seems to be this month's hot political satirist and things like that. Where do you think down the road maybe you know, the Capitol Steps will be best remembered for? Uh, yeah. Or what would you like to see the Capitol Steps best remembered for uh, over the course of their 39 years? Um, well, I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, after the 2016 elections, you know, things were very contentious. People were fighting over the Thanksgiving dinner table. Um, people were not getting along. And some people would come to our show and they would say, you know, I wasn't sure I could laugh about politics, but I did, and I feel better. And I hope that those people went home and sort of remembered the show in a way that, okay, maybe we could sort of try to get along, find some common ground, um, and all feel better about each other. Uh, that would That's kind of what we were aiming for. I'd like I think to add be, on to that. I I'd think like to add on this. to that. that oh, go ahead, oops, Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> that... Uh, right after 9-11 uh, and in periods when, when there was some, something really big that brought the nation down, we would come and do shows and people would come up to us afterwards and say, I thought I would never be able to laugh again. Um, it's a real stress reliever. And that's one of the, for, for, the, for the audience and for us. And that was one of the things that, that I think is a great part of our legacy. So, I, I would agree. I think I think we'd have we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, say that uh, that uh, Elena, as a managing artistic director for 39 years, has kept artists, actors, singers uh, working for for decades. And I don't. There is nothing else that besides Mousetrap in London and sheer <laughs> madness at the Kennedy Center. There's nothing like us uh it's just as far as longevity and and we're certainly going to be remembered for that because all of us many of us i mean i raised kids on this on this show and evan and and and, and so you know it, it's it's uh, there is nothing like it you know actors as we were talking about before elena actors are used to auditioning every few months and just to have a steady gig um with benefits you know it's 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 yeah. pretty unprecedented so yeah oh, just to thank you to, to piggyback on both of those things real quick. Uh, number one, I just think that to what Elena said and what Barry said is absolutely true that I think particularly as our politics has grown further apart in terms of going to our various uh, polls on the opposite sides of the stadium, I think it has been harder to find a more bipartisan track of comedy, so to speak. You sort of take a stance on one side and then you, you throw your arrows from that side. Um, and so to Elena's credit uh, over the years to find something that is, yes, family friendly and PG and equal opportunity offenders and middle of the road uh, is really remarkable to have done it for basically four decades. And so that in and of itself is, a, is an achievement. And then additionally to what Mike said, um, I know Mark, you and I talk have talked before about Sondheim and he has this great, you know, this great song finishing the hat where he says, look, I made a hat where there never was a hat, right? This thing didn't exist before Elena and Bill and Jim Adala said like, we're gonna make this a thing, right? This is gonna be a thing. And then it became a thing because of their own creativity and artistic force and, uh, and uh, an ability to create this into a business and for working artists. Um, and, and so it's, it's amazing that, it, that, that it's done what it has done for, for this amount of time. 
I agree. And one thing I would add, that my uh, bill, my association with the Capital Steps has been one of the happiest professional and personal experiences that I've had because. The ability to make people laugh and forget what's going on in the real world by portraying what's going on in the real world is really more than just a skill. It's really an art form. And I think, Elena, you and your uh, creators of the Capital Steps deserve a lot of credit for that and for providing an environment that gives a lot of artists and other people affiliated an opportunity to work long run with a great organization. So thank you. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, we're going to end this program today with another clip of one of the Capital Steps uh, hits over the years. And as we do, if you want to learn more about the Capital Steps, you can go to capsteps.com. There are still CDs going way back in time that you can purchase. And you can go to the U their YouTube channel and watch some of their uh, videos of performances, uh, not only on their thing, but if you you go to WSKB Community Radio's Arts Beat Archives, you can find two years of programs we did from Cranwell with various members of the Steps. And so I hope that people don't forget who the Capital Steps are and that you're forced to do a reunion show if it's not a couple of years from now while, while we're all still mobile and able to uh, remember because people <laughs> won't want to kick back and remember. What what was the George Bush one in two years like? So, um, you know, hopefully there'll be a reunion show down the road. But I want to thank you all for joining me today up on the top left. And they'll wave as I say their names so you never forget them. Janet Gordon Davison on the upper left. Uh, Mike Thornton, upper right. Evan Casey, lower left. Elena Newport, center. And Barry Byrne. Thanks, Capital Steps folks, for joining me today on Artsbeat. We're going to leave you with another clip of one of their songs. If you've missed a part of today's program, you'll be able to find it archived on WSKB's uh, community radio YouTube page. Catch us next Friday at 8 o'clock for another Arts Beat. Peter Coles has been our chief engineer. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. We'll see you next week. And now, an in-depth look at maintaining a relationship in the digital age. You don't send me emails. You just forward dumb jokes. You never text with me anymore. You send eggplant emoji like ten times a day. <laughs> I remember when our Facebook chats were splendid. But now you are unfriended. Your phone's only 3G. You're an obsolete guy. I just got a Bluetooth, so how high tech am I? But you got it from eating a blueberry pie. I don't spend time flossing anymore. We seem so out of kilter. You're now in my spam filter. Are you saying our sex life could now use some help? The last time we made love, you got one star on Yelp. <laughs> I remember when we'd spend our weekends Skyping. Now to the left I'm swiping. When I want to go out, you play Fortnite instead. You changed our Wi-Fi password to wish she was dead. And the words Microsoft best described you in bed. <laughs> Your hashtag isn't trending anymore. What has caused you to put this man's love on the shelf? It all changed and I wanted some time to myself. Since I walked in and I caught you Googling yourself. My iPod won't be docking. Your touchpad I am locking. My pop-ups I'll be blocking. Uh.